you so much for, for being here today, um, for joining us on a Wednesday morning here at Unbound. It means a lot that you uh, took the time out of your out of your calendar to um, to be here. Um, we're very pleased to welcome Ambassador David Young, who's the uh, current U.S. Ambassador to Malawi. Um, Ambassador Young has held past positions in Zambia, South Africa, and Nigeria as well. Um, and today he'll, he'll discuss current events and policies from his latest two positions in Malawi and Zambia, explore cross-cutting issues and trends in Africa, and speak about his journey from growing up in Kansas City, attending Mizzou, and rising the ranks of ambassadorship. Um, so my name is Evan Verplew. I'm the executive director here at the International Relations Council. Um, we're really pleased to be um, partnering both with um, with Unbound and Resur Resurrection Church um, on this program. Um, I appreciate the, the support from both organizations. Um, before uh, moving on, I'm gonna um, pass things off to um, Preeta here from uh, Unbound to talk a little bit about the work that they do here. Thank you, Evan. Uh, good morning, my name is Preeta Hariharan and I am the Vice President of International Programs here at Unbound. I support our Africa and Asia programs. Um, if you don't know about Unbound, we are an international development organization. We work with uh, children, elderly, and youth, and mothers uh, living in extreme poverty in 17 countries around the world. In Africa specifically, we work in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Madagascar, and Rwanda. Um, in, uh, in Africa, we have about 49,000 families when I last polled the numbers. Um, and um, I won't take up too much of your time, but we do have some information about Unbound in the table uh, at the back. And also wanted to extend an invitation for anybody who has time to stick around afterwards to take a tour of our Experience Center where we can talk more about some of the work we do around the world um, and the programming we do around the world. I see a lot of familiar faces here and some new faces, so welcome everybody. Nice to have you all here. Oh, um, before I forget, uh, Becky, if you can just stand up. Becky Findlay, if you haven't said hello to her, please do before you leave. She is our um, regional project director for Africa and works directly on a day-to-day -day basis with our Africa teams. Thank you. Thank you, Preeta. Oh, no worries. Um, so now I'm going to pass things off to uh, Cherie Reese from Resurrection, who will talk a little bit about the work that they do. They do. And um, thank you again for your support of this program. Good morning. I just wanted to share a little bit. Uh, basically, we work with different um, countries around the world and we work with the local leaders and empower the local leaders so that they can discern what they need to change in their own communities and holistic community development. And so on your chairs, we did list, uh, put down our podcast and I would love for you guys to share that with anyone, you know, that's interested in what's taking place globally. Basically, um, we set up the podcast so that we could hear from the people on the ground, the people that we normally can't hear from um, to share their stories of what they're doing in their communities from food security to um, mig or migration to uh, clean water and health and sanitation and all those things. So uh, last season we talked to a lot of people why they immigrate because that's a very hot topic um, and people are very divisive, but our job was just to have people tell their personal stories, why they had to leave Ukraine, why they had to leave Afghanistan, different things like that. So anyhow, um, we're really trying to reach non-anomaly religious people. So we are a church and we love Jesus, but um, the goal is to reach the younger generations and help them understand that um, churches do care about the world um, and we're trying to give a voice to the voiceless. So please uh, share this with anyone you know that is interested in things taking place globally. Thank you. Thank you, Shuri. Um, I know many of you are familiar with the work that we do at the IRC, um, but our mission is to strengthen Kansas City's global perspective by maintaining an active dialogue around world events, global issues, and their impact in our community. Um, as a nonpartisan educational nonprofit organization, the IRC values informed civil discourse, accessibility, and substance as we work to sharpen our community's 21st century global acumen. Um, today's program will also be recorded, so if you know anybody who might be uh, interested in any of the subject matter that's discussed today, um, we'll be sharing this link out um, with you following the program, so we invite you to share that with your, with your network. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start by introducing our moderator. Um, Joel Matuku was originally born in Kenya, but moved to Zimbabwe at an early age, where he did all of his primary schooling. He believes the amazing experiences during these years helped shape his outlook about the possibilities the world has to offer. Joel came to the U.S. in the 90s for education, where he completed his bachelor's and master's degrees in business. 
He's lived in Kansas and Missouri area since arriving and currently works for an investment advisory firm in the area. Joel serves as the commissioner for Zimbabwe with the Ethnic Enrichment Committee, a IRC organizational member in Kansas City, um, and he is honored to be a part of this uh, wonderful organization as it allows for sharing of culture and traditions through their many outreach events. Joel, thank you so much for being here today. Um, and I'll also go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. Um, ambassador David Young was sworn in as the US ambassador to Malawi on March 3rd, 2022. Ambassador Young has served in African posts for the past decade. Um, he serves as Charge d'Affaires Affairs at the US Embassy in Zambia from 2020 to 2021, um, and also served at the US Embassy in South Africa in 2019, and is Deputy, Deputy Chief of Mission at the US Embassy in Nigeria from 2016 to 2019. Um, he also served in Zambia as Deputy Chief of Mission from 2013 to 2016, um, and br briefly served as Acting Deputy Chief of Mission in Sudan in 2012. Um, a foreign service officer for 32 years, Ambassador Young previously served as a deputy director of the Office of the U.S. Special Envoy for Sudan and South Sudan, executive assistant under the Secretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy and Human Rights, um, a Pearson Fellow in the House of Representatives, um, public affairs officer at the embassy in Guatemala and director of the Office of International Religious Freedom. Um, his other assignments include tours in Vietnam, Panama, and the State Department Operations Center and several country desks. Um, Ambassador Young graduated from the um, medical, uh, excuse me, from the University of Missouri with a bachelor's degree in journalism. Um, he studied um, ecumenical studies at Trinity College, um, Dublin, Ireland on a uh, Rotary Foundation scholarship. Um, he received a Master of Divinity degree in social ethics and a Master of Arts in international relations from Boston University. Um, born and raised here in Kansas City, Missouri, Ambassador Young and his wife, Diane, um, have two grown children, Paul and Sarah. He enjoys travel with his family, going to U2 and Coldplay concerts and sports of all kinds, um, especially watching the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, <laughs> and he's passionate about leading uh, teams, coaching and servant leadership. Um, Ambassador Young, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to be here today and please uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you. How much time do I have? Um, yeah. That's perfect. Okay. Thank you, Evan, for that wonderful introduction. It is always embarrassing to have your resume read, but you know, we have to do it in my business. So thank you, man. Um, hey, and you need to give me the, the hook because uh, as my cousins, Jane and Rob know, I have the gift of gab from John Young, my father, and I kissed the Blarney Stone and I could go for two hours. So you tell me when I should shut up and pass to my friend from Zimbabwe. Um, this is a, an amazing homecoming for me for these last four days since I touched base with Jane and Rob a few days ago, my cousins. Um, as I look around the room, and I've met several of you already, you like connect all the dots from my childhood and youth and formative years. It's quite amazing, really. Um, and um, I have, uh, I'm engaged in a program right now for about four days and I fly out tomorrow morning uh, back to officiate at my goddaughter's wedding outside Philadelphia, which will be a very special family experience. Um, but um, I am a son of Kansas City. So I grew up, I went to Center High School. We have a Center High School grad here, I think. And uh, I then went to the University of Missouri, MIZ, Oh, look at that, you know, I haven't been able to do that for 30 years. And um, and I studied journalism there and had planned to go on, even before I went to Mizzou, I was studying Martin Luther King and Gandhi when I was 17 at Center High School on an independent study. And I decided that what my parents and family had been saying that I should think about for years that yes, I would go into the ordained ministry and be a United Methodist minister. So having folks from Resurrection here is very special too. My uh, dad actually attended Resurrection for a number of years before he died uh, when I was away in the Foreign Service. And I've been to your church several times. And your church does amazing work with Africa and is a real trailblazer in building links in the United Methodist Church and maintaining those links with Africa. So thank you for what you do. Um, I went on to study on a Rotary scholarship and my Rotarian friend uh, is here. And so I'm meeting with Rotarians earlier today, which will be a very, very special thing. Um, I am um, 
the uh, the Rotary year was a life changing year for me because I studied comparative religion. I studied Islam and Abrahamic faith dialogue for the first time. I studied Buddhism uh, and looked at peace and justice issues coming out of religion and how an ecumenical vision of peace and justice is what uh, faith can in as inspire you to. So I kind of delved deeply into interfaith dialogue and social justice work out of the context of faith before I came back to Boston University uh, to, to go to seminary. And then I focused on social ethics. Um, I picked uh, Boston University, which is the United Methodist Seminary, in large part because of its long history of working on social justice, because Martin Luther King did his doctorate there. And I had a very special opportunity that two of his professors taught me in the 1980s who had been Dr. King's professors at the beginning of their career in the 50s. And that was very special. Uh, Walter Mulder, who had been the dean of the seminary at uh, BU when MLK was there in his formative years before he went to Montgomery, um, Dr. Mulder taught me first about South Africa. And uh, I learned about Archbishop Desmond Tutu from Dr. Mulder. And um, years later, I got to have dinner with my hero in Southern Africa before he died. So um, I, when I was in uh, seminary, uh, I got very passionate from that year in Ireland about global affairs and service around the world. I got really concerned, frankly, about some of US foreign policy in Central America back in the 80s. And um, so I, I joke that some people that I didn't necessarily agree with on foreign policy issues inspired me to go into foreign policy. So um, I decided I wanted to serve my country for a few years to have an impact on policy issues in Central America that I cared about. And so I started learning Spanish, did a one year masters at BU after my MDiv. My mom, as you probably know, Jane and Rob said, are you a professional student? Are you ever going to get a J-O-B? And um, I finally did. But um, I was kind of uh, getting very passionate about foreign policy. And then a professor said, you ought to take the foreign service exam. And so my random meandering through my 20s, by the time I was 26, I took the foreign service exam and passed it. And then I got a job offer the next year to come in to be a diplomat for a couple of years. Uh, I thought, well, you know, I want to work on my Spanish, go to somewhere in Central America. I'll do this three or four years, um, but that was 34 years ago. So my life service as a public servant has woven together all these pieces of my life because I have used the journalism skills from Mizzou to be a writer, reporter, editor, uh, broadcaster, public speaker for the US government in my job as a political officer and a public affairs officer, a deputy charge and an ambassador. Um, and that's been foundational to the work that I've done as a diplomat. But my motivation of faith, which goes back to MLK and my studies and Desmond Tutu has been profound in motivating me to do what I've done. I have done probably 20 years of my career focused on democracy, human rights, peace and justice work. And so I've also used my faith background from those years at, on the Rotary Scholarship to promote interfaith dialogue in Nigeria, getting imams and pastors together in the middle belt of Nigeria that's been so um, challenged by the extreme violence, the religious extremism, violent extremism from all sides, uh, and the resolving conflict so tragically in parts of Nigeria by violence. Um, when I was in Vietnam, uh, as the human rights religious freedom officer, I engaged with Buddhist monks. So the engagement that I had studied in Ireland about Buddhism and uh, uh, I met Dick Nhat Hine and went on a retreat with him. If you knew him before he died just recently, like uh, within months, I think of Archbishop Tutu, um, we were enabled, we helped Dick Nhat Hine go back to Vietnam uh, for some spiritual retreats and engagement years after he had left during the years of the Vietnam War. Uh, Martin Luther King had nominated Thich Nhat Hinh for the Nobel Peace Prize. So lots of links here, you know, for my life and my service. And then um, again, 
I have, um, in a very ecumenical way and an interfaith way, used my faith background. I am actually ordained as a United Methodist minister, which is, I think I'm the only career diplomat that's a minister and a, and a, well, and a journalist and an ambassador. So, you know, my theory is, the theory of the case is, if you stay in for 34 years, like, it's just longevity. I mean, they don't know what to do with you, so they just make you a pester. So, you know, it happens. Um, during my career, I started out focused on Central America and Latin America, as I said, and then kind of migrated to Southeast Asia with the work on Vietnam, ASEAN issues, and Burma, Myanmar. And then my wife, Diane, uh, started working in our Education USA program, which is a wonderful program that promotes, on behalf of the U.S. government, study uh, of students from around the world at universities and colleges in the United States. And amazing students, like some of those I saw yesterday at Mizzou, uh, at Lincoln University where I spoke, and at Central Methodist University where I was yesterday on my speaking tour, um, have come to the United States in part because of the the Education USA program that has promoted study and kind of matchmaking for students to come to Mizzou and and that that school out um, west about an hour. Rock, uh, what, is, what are the rock a shock? What does that mean? No, I'm just kidding. My uh, cousins have, and I have a tiger Jayhawk uh, rivalry, very uh, with my the extreme devotion of Jane to the Jayhawks rivals my Patrick Mahomes bromance fanaticism. So, but um, all that to say, though, Edu Diane came to work on the Education USA program. And then that led me 12 years ago to have my first assignment focused on Africa policy. And I started working on Sudan and South Sudan out of Washington when Sudan, South Sudan got its independence. I was working on the portfolio and then. And then um, we decided coming out of that job, we would go to Sub-Saharan Africa and we went to the wonderful country of Zambia. And uh, we had an amazing three years there. And then that started our kids, graduated from high school, the American International School in Lusaka. And uh, that's been a very, very special place for us. I went back to Lusaka later. So I've spent five years in your wonderful country of Zambia, which is the second longest, of, it's my, with Malawi, your cousins, my second adopted home uh, after the United States. So uh, other than Missouri, and Arlene, in Virginia, I've spent more time in Zambia, Malawi than any other place in the world. So it's been very special to us. Um, and then from Zambia, went to Nigeria for three years and then to South Africa briefly. I was kind of asked to leave, but that's an inside baseball story that probably need to get this former teetotaler a beer or a glass of wine to tell you, but that's another question. Uh, and then went back to Zambia. And one of the, I'll describe in a minute, one of the impactful experiences we had in Lusaka until two years ago through the election of HH and Lungu uh, that took place. And then I was nominated by President Biden to be ambassador to Malawi and was eventually confirmed by the Senate and arrived in Malawi, as Evan said, uh, early last year. And I've been there the last roughly two years. Um, your son of Kansas City has decided after 35 years, I'm actually retiring next year because for my next season of service, I want to be a university lecturer and a coach and a mentor to other diplomats, to young African leaders and to students and folks who are interested in learning about the world. And um, my one of my great mentors, Phil Wagaman, who is a very prominent United Methodist pastor and social ethicist who married us years ago, uh, yeah, 30 years ago. Um, he's actually still teaching at 91. And I saw him five uh, days ago in Washington where he teaches courses at his retirement center in suburban Washington. And people get community college credit for Phil's classes at 91. So I'm 61, I have a long second career ahead of me. Uh, I'm a bit of an energizer bunny, so um, in my contacts with folks at Mizzou the last 48 hours, we've been exploring some teaching opportunities that I may have. So um, starting in 2025, after I leave uh, Malawi, 
um, we are going to alternate between spending probably six months of the year in our beloved corner of Southern Africa, probably based out of Cape Town, which Diane describes as her favorite city in the world. And it's, if you haven't been to Cape Town or Southern Africa, it's an amazing area of the world. Um, and probably affiliated with some of the universities there in teaching, and then alternating with six months in the US. And uh, given what I've learned in the last 48 hours, I think I'm gonna be coming through Jane and Rob's house on the way to Columbia, uh, not infrequently. So we'll see if I'm welcome still. Okay, as long as the Tigers aren't beating the Jayhawks, you'll let me in. Oh, I forgot to do that, didn't I? Oh, that's right. But uh, anyway, I wanted to just give a little bit of that introduction because the connections I have with so many of you and your organizations is profound. And for me to do this uh, hometown diplomat uh, speaking tour has been really special. And Evan and the uh, the relation, International Relations uh, Council, I really appreciate you guys inviting me. Let me just talk briefly about a couple of issues for the continent of Africa. I want to talk broadly about some, several things, maybe mention a couple things about some of the places I've served, Nigeria, Zambia, Malawi, briefly. And then uh, I'll hand it over and then we can have some questions and dialogue. Uh, I would ask that I have an expertise over the last 10 years focused on Sub-Saharan Africa. So I would really like to keep this conversation focused on Africa or something from my background if you're interested in those kind of issues. But I'm not authorized to talk about some of the other global headline issues of Israel and Gaza or Ukraine or Russia or China. So if we could, you know, I, I won't be able to respond. So I'll just look at you dumbly if you ask me about that. So I would prefer to keep focus on these issues that are my expertise and where I'm authorized to talk to a public group, if that's okay. So sound good? Great. So, um, you know, I don't know if anybody saw, there was an amazing piece of reportage that Declan Walsh from the New York Times did about 10 days ago, where he wrote a really interesting think piece called Old World, Young Africa. And I'd really recommend people to go read it if you have a chance. New York Times, 10 days ago, Old World, New Africa. How the continent is transforming. And the demographic change that is coming to your continent is your birthplace continent is amazing. Um, it's one of the global changes, tectonic plates, you know, that is changing the world. And it will dramatically change the world because the continent of Africa that has 1 billion people today, by 2050, will have 2 billion people. It's doubling in population within 20, 22 years. It's the youngest continent on Earth. And by 2050, 2060, roughly, De Declan Walsh documents this, but roughly 60%, 50 to 60%, of young people in the world will be on the continent of Africa. Think of that. 50 to 60% of young people in the world. That's an extraordinary demographic change in the world. You know, we focus, I'll make a brief comment about India and China, seeing the flags here. I don't see China, but I see India. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, I was thinking, maybe no, China. That's a whole other discussion. The, uh, but there's a lot, of comp a lot of competition, a lot of attention focused on the West and China today, of course, the rise of India with its now largest population on Earth um, and the growing economy of China, the military of China. But it's very interesting when you look at demographics. I was talking with the British government's deputy chief economist the other day about uh, global trends for population in Asia. You know, China's population, not unlike Japan's or Italy's or the United States in some ways, is, is graying. Uh, like me, getting older and older. And as more um, Chinese get older, what's going to happen after the aftermath of the one-child policy as the kind of the huge population bubble gets older and older, China's going to have the same uh, demographic dynamic that Japan has had, where it's getting the median age is getting older and older and older. And a small group of younger people are going to have to provide the equivalent of social security and the safety net for an older population. 
So we're very focused on China today with competition, and that will be a competition issue for the future. But China is growing so dramatically that in some ways its economy is certainly per capita will plateau and even start to decline per capita. So that's an interesting global trend we don't often hear. And I think by contrast, Africa is growing enormously and the population growth is growing enormously. And that I think is double-edged because it's the poorest continent, as we know. And when you look at the 20 poorest countries in the world, you know, probably 18 of them are on the continent. Malawi is, has now been classified, moved from the third poorest to the eighth poorest country in the world. But it's a country that wrestles with extensive extreme poverty. I'll talk about that a little bit, about Malawi specifically in a moment. But um, you have a divergence on the continent, and Declan Walsh really describes this well in the New York Times, where you have a wave of entrepreneurs and IT professionals and business experts and creatives and healthcare professionals and engineers who are transforming countries in Africa from Kenya and, and others dramatically. And you know some of the cutting edge work that's being done in mobile banking and mobile money and IT and creative uh, innovations are coming from the African continent. So the dynamism and entrepreneurial energy you see in large parts of Nigeria, in Kenya, in Ghana, in South Africa is going to the, the hustle of Zimbabweans and the hustle of Zambians, you know, is going to change the continent and the world. We are more connected today with Africa than we have been and will be in the future. Uh, I don't know if any of you looking around the room, uh, maybe Evan, I don't know. They, do people listen to like Burna Boy or Davido or some of the Afrobeat music? You know, it's the music, the culture, the food, the uh, immigration, uh, culture, religion from Christian and uh, there's reverse, um, evangelization coming from Christians and Muslims coming to the United States and the West. You know, it's reversal of some historical trends that have happened. The, the interconnected ties with the African continent, with our country, and with other countries around the world is going to be dramatic. Um, as our population, you know, we have a very, and again, you mentioned about, uh, Frita, you mentioned about immigration and how it's so controversial. But, you know, immigration, I strongly believe, is one of the strengths of our country. You know, I'm a big believer in the Statue of Liberty and our defining uh, ethos as a melting pot. But as our population ages, our immigration openness is one of our cultural, political, economic strengths. China, Japan are having harder challenges having people immigrate. And with a declining population, their economy can't support a growing population. So having folks come from around the world, including from Africa, is very good for us as non-African Americans. I mean, as a Mzungu uh, uh, white guy from uh, Kansas City, you know, I benefit from the diversity in America greatly, and I think we all do. I think if you came here today, you, many of you would agree with me on that, right? The, uh, but I think that's part of the dialogue of understanding how we are connected as one world. So those demographic changes are profound. Again, love to have you read the Declan Walsh article. Think about it. It's a big global trends piece. Uh, it's a part of first, I think, of four big pieces the New York Times is doing about Africa trends. So again, you've heard my pitch for the good journalism from uh, Declan Walsh. Um, for Malawi. Um, it is a wonderful country considered the warm heart of Africa, you know, the cousins of Zambians next door. Um, very common uh, linguistic links. I was able to speak my few words of Chichewa and connect with you uh, in Nyanja, right? Because of the family links of language and ethnicity in uh, between Zambia and Malawi. Uh, Panji Kaunda, by the way, who's the son of KK, Kenneth Kaunda is the High Commissioner of Zambia now in Malawi, a good friend of mine who I know because I knew KK's family in Zambia. Uh, but um, Malawi is wrestling most fundamentally with an economy that's not growing. And for those of you who've been there and have been involved in humanitarian work, 
It's one of the, the tragedies of the country. It's got a strong democratic tradition and the alternation of political parties across elections uh, over the last years, which has been very, very positive. It's a fundamentally peaceful and stable country in many ways, despite the economic challenges and the extreme poverty that maybe 60% plus of the population experiences. But it's, um, it's kind of extreme challenge is the economy is not growing and yet like the whole region of sub-Saharan Africa, the population's doubling in 20 years. So per capita income is being suppressed. You have a huge number, it's a very rural population. So you have a large number of people who are uh, subsistence farmers. You have maybe one hectare plots and are growing corn. Uh, historically, Malawi is dependent on the export of tobacco. Of course, uh, I don't smell too much smoke in the room. And so one of the public health uh, good things of our time is smoking is declining, right? In our country and many countries around the world. That hasn't been good in that sense for the Malawian economy because they have earned their export earnings from tobacco. Mining and mineral uh, wealth has declined dramatically. So you have a very dramatic statistic today that Malawi's exports, uh, net exports, are now 50% what they were a decade ago. Think about that with the populations that doubling. It's been very challenging. The country has very little forex, foreign exchange, hard currency from dollars and other currencies. And that is tremendously challenging because they cannot import fertilizer, essential medicines, uh, foods, certain foodstuffs and others. It has provoked challenges with food security, uh, fuel. Uh, there are massive fuel lines. For those of you who've been in Malawi recently, you see the massive fuel lines that snake around the stations. Sometimes people keep their cars there for 20 hours trying to fill up a tank, and they can't even fully fill the tank because they're not authorized to get that much. But people have to almost speculate on which station will get fuel next. It's a tremendous challenge for both the middle class in the cities and the long way in Blantyre, but um, it also is grinding for people in the rural countryside, you know, the folks who live in subsistence. Um, again, I'm giving you kind of the downer statistics, but it's a reality. Uh, about 37% of Malawian children are stunted. So their brains haven't fully developed because of lack of nutrition in the first two years of life. Um, there's only about 10% of Malawian kids that eventually go on to tertiary university education. And it's less than 5%, according to the statistics. I find this shocking sometimes when I hear numbers, but that less than 5% of second graders can read for content at grade level. So if you think about what Malawi is experiencing, they desperately need to expand their economy. Um, I was in um, my beloved brother's, beloved professor's house in Fayette, Missouri this morning and was furiously making phone calls back in a long way uh, and sending WhatsApps like crazy because we're about on the cusp, if you follow Malawian politics and economics, of helping Malawi get an IMF agreement, an extended credit facility, which is critically important to the fight against poverty in Malawi. Because since the economy can't grow, they need to get uh, sub, uh, assistance in through the IMF and the World Bank. And getting this ECF, Extended Credit Facility, is essential for the progress to go forward with the economic, macroeconomic stability and being able to service their debt, basically to have foreign exchange. And they're going to have to readjust their exchange rate because there are parallel exchange rates where the, inf the formal exchange rate, which people have to conduct business in if you're a company, is 1100 kwacha to the dollar, but the informal exchange rate is 1700. And those of you who have a background in business can appreciate how so much of the economy, economic activity is happening outside the formal sector. It's not being taxed, it's not being regulated. There's all kinds of tremendous challenges there. So we're on the cusp, I think, within days of Malawi achieving this IMF agreement that. I've put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into the last two years. So we're almost there. And Malawi has worked really hard to make that happen. Uh, and then a devaluation will be announced uh, very shortly. 
So um, that's part of what's on the path to economic recovery. It will help create more trade and investment with uh, and bringing in FDI, which is so important to growing the economy and creating jobs, creating export-led growth. Uh, as they diversify from tobacco into macadamia nuts, peanuts, uh, dried mangoes, soya, other export crops, that's really, really important. So that's um, some of the, the biggest challenges for Malawi as, as a poor, uh, challenged, impoverished country. Now, on the positive side, thinking about the positive negatives, it's a wonderful, lovely country. Uh, the people who I was meeting with an amazing doctoral student at Mizzou in uh, biology who's from Malawi, who knows about all my social media, so it was a little embarrassing, actually. But uh, the uh, she introduced me when I spoke at Mizzou two days ago. And uh, she's the best and the brightest. That's the youthful hope of the future for the warm heart of Africa. And you have to hold in balance these two sides of the coin. As I talked about the demographic change that's coming to, Mal to Africa, um, one of the challenges is as some of the population races forward, how are others who are left out, children who are stunted and aren't educated and don't have good health, how is the digital divide going to be amplified as it becomes an AI divide, as a virtual reality divide, as technological change races forward? Some of the entrepreneurial experts will race forward and ride the wave into an incredible growth-oriented, technology-driven, entrepreneurial, creative future, but then who will be left behind? And I think that is one of the profound challenges as Africa expands over the next 20 years to have 2 billion people. So um, again, those are a few things uh, about that. Let me make a last comment. You haven't given me the hook yet, Evan, you're very, very nice. But uh, my last comment is to, and I don't think I need to convince this audience as much. Maybe I'm just watching your faces and your backgrounds and knowing the organizations you work for. So I'm probably presuming, but, Sometimes people ask me, so why do we have a State Department? And why do we have a Foreign Service? And why do we spend money to have embassies overseas? Well, if you've traveled as part of a medical mission or a rotary mission or student exchanges or others, you know we provide consular services uh, to Americans and help to people when they get in distress and they have challenges. Um, we work. Um, to facilitate trade and investment and work to support US companies to help create jobs and advance mutual interest economically on both sides of the ocean. Um, but we do a lot of advocacy too. And let me give you a couple quick anecdotes. And one of you knows one of them very, very well. I told you before we started. Um, a couple years ago when I was in Zambia, there was a very historic election coming. Uh, between Edgar Lungu, who had been in power for, what, five years, six years? Yeah, since the death of his predecessor, Michael Sata. He was running for re-election against an opposition leader, Haka Indi Hichilema, who had run for president four times, five times. He had been arrested about a dozen times and spent four months in prison at one point. Well, Edgar Lungu, who I knew from my first time in Zambia, um, I used to meet with a Charge d'Affaires acting ambassador on the weekends one-on-one, -on -one, and I have a confession as a former teetotaling son of John and Marge. I drink a lot of red wine with him. But anyway, in my wine diplomacy with Edgar Lungu on the weekends, we, uh, which is a moral failing perhaps, as you probably know, <laughs> the, uh, we had lots of dialogue about the upcoming election and how he was going to engage uh, in the country. And he told me he hates HH, the opposition leader. He said, I'm going to arrest him again. He cannot stand for this election. And so he was, he was on the cusp of doing that. But I, Using my diplomatic skills and my relationship with him, I kept coming back to him over and over and said, Mr. President, if you arrest your opponent, you really have no hope of getting the approval of the international community if you win again, because you won't have democratic credentials, you know, as a democratic nation, if you've arrested your opponent and then won a, a staged election. And he grumbled and he went back and forth. And we, this happened about three weekends in a row. 
And so finally he told me, you know, because we use this stultified language in diplomacy, which I hate. I like to be Dave or Ambassador David if you insist, but nothing more than that. But he said, Your Excellency, I hear you. So I will not arrest HH before the election happens. But the day that I beat him, he's going into prison. The amazing thing, as you know, several months later, there was a historic vote that beat Edgar Lungu by 20 percentage points, even though his opponent was not able to campaign in the election. That, in my view, we then were able to get him to peacefully step down in transition through some backdoor diplomacy. And in my view, that has led to become Zambia becoming not a nirvana or paradise, but a democratic success story on the continent, where economic reform is at least has a chance. More foreign investment has come in. Relations with the United States and the West and with democratic nations have improved. And there is a fighting chance for fighting the kleptocracy in the country that was advancing strongly from before. I don't mean to describe it like all is right in Zambia. I know it's not. But um, I think if you looked at what had happened, if there hadn't been a democratic election for the people to decide, it made a big difference on the politics and the economics of helping turn around the Zambian economy. So that's one little example of advocacy. Another example of advocacy I'd throw out from my experience is from Nigeria. I know you all would be familiar with Boko Haram, um, the group that had kidnapped hundreds of schoolgirls, had wrecked havoc uh, throughout uh, northern Nigeria, Borno State, um, up in the northeast of Nigeria over the years. It had been a terrible, brutal, horrific terrorist group that had done terrible, terrible things. Um, one time we were working uh, in our interagency group at the U.S. Embassy in Abuja, and we, it became very evident that there were a group of about 12,000 IDPs, internally displaced people, who had migrated to a path where Boko Haram fighters were advancing on them as they came towards, in the, the central region, towards the capital. And we were very nervous that these many of these people could be kidnapped, uh, that awful things could happen to them. So we scurried out and met with Vice President Osambajo and the Chief of Staff to President Buhari and were able to negotiate a quick solution so the IDPs were moved and nobody was captured and nobody was allowed to uh, uh, be fallen into the hands of Boko Haram. One of the things that happened is that from then the counterterrorism support that we were able to work with the Nigerian government, admittedly a challenging government and especially its military, but through some of the work on the counterterrorism cooperation we were engaged in, Boko Haram no longer exists. It's now dissipated. And so it's not the threat to kidnap school children that it was before. There is a successor branch of ISIS, Islamic State West Africa, which continues to be very challenging throughout Nigeria and the country continues to still balance ba battle terrorist groups, extremist groups. but. Boko Haram, uh, led by Shekau, does no longer exist. So sometimes the things we do make a difference. Lastly, I would say an ongoing trend that many of you will know from your countries or your travel is what I would say rivals the Marshall Plan as the greatest foreign assistance project and effort of modern times. Anybody have a guess what I'm talking about? Now, go is a good guess. Another one? It's in health. Yeah, through USAID, CDC, and other PEPFAR. The U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which was started by George W. Bush, I think is his most amazing, his incredible legacy. Because that program from 20 years ago has saved about 25 million lives. Um, 20 years ago, uh, the number of AIDS deaths throughout the world, but especially throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, was enormous. Staff that I work with in the countries I've served with across Africa said every single day we went to a funeral for someone we knew, a friend, a family member, a colleague, others who had died of AIDS. It was like coffins were stacked up on the street. It was horrific. It was unbelievable. But through the efforts of the PEPFAR program, mobilizing the global community and working with UNAIDS and the Global Fund, 
uh, and partner countries throughout the world and especially across Africa, there was some dramatic decline of AIDS related deaths. And today, AIDS, I mean, HIV uh, is no longer a death sentence as it was before. Um, the Malawi, for example, has made enormous progress on HIV, uh, um, combating HIV. There are, there are UN uh, targets for uh, what they call the 95-95-95 goals, which Malawi has basically achieved. They have reached 94% of people in Malawi know their HIV status. 96% of people who know their status are on antiretroviral drugs if they're positive. And 95% of people who are on ARVs to save their lives are virally suppressed. They can't transmit the virus. The thing about it is a million Malawians today are alive because of the work that we do and what your taxpayer dollars help support. And it's not a lot of your taxpayer dollars. It's really cents on the dollar. But when we all contribute to this effort, it saves a million lives every single day in Malawi, in Zambia, in Nigeria, in Tanzania, in South Africa. And together, 25 million lives have been changed and literally hundreds of, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of kids are not orphaned. Think about what it means to a child. You think about the work you do supporting vulnerable children around the world. Think about what it means to a child to have parents and loved ones and guardians and mentors around. Think about what that means in terms of combating poverty, extremism, you know, other kinds of desperation that people feel. We are truly, as we've discussed, and as you know from the IRC, we are one world. We are connected. And, you know, whether it's global health pandemics, terrorist organizations, religious organizations for good, for proselytizing, you know, for sharing information, cultural exchange, the music we listen to, uh, the culinary traditions that enrich us, the trade and investment that make us more prosperous and drive technological change, we're connected. And when we make interventions like PEPFAR, it helps us. It's not just charity. It's our mutual interest. And I strongly, strongly believe that. And I think it pains me. I'll make one last comment. It pains me back home. And I've watched this 30 years from overseas, especially the last decade in Africa. But it pains me we are so divided here back home and that we don't talk to each other. We don't get the same news sources. We don't come together. We don't build coalitions like we used to, I think, as much as we used to. And the thing which I find very profound about my public service at embassies, especially the last 10 years helping lead embassies in Africa, is that it's still possible to work together across our differences. I used to chair a Northeast working group in Nigeria where we focused on the ISIS, Boko Haram, instability, poverty, human rights challenges in northern Nigeria. And we would have a group of 40 of us in a conference room. So a little about this group, a little bit bigger maybe, around in a big conference room. And we would do strategizing among U.S. special forces, human rights advocates, trade officers, intel officers, stabilization officers, humanitarian assistance experts, and we would work together for a common goal, one mission, one team, we talked about it. And we did good things and we worked together and we accomplished bigger things than we could if we were working separately. The irony, when you think about it, I used to think that some of those folks in the room with me who are my brothers and sisters as we led this effort we probably wouldn't talk to each other, some of us. We would go to our communities back home. And how tragic that is, but how special it is that your teams overseas can indeed work together like that. It's one of the things I found very moving and inspiring from my foreign service uh, time and helping lead embassies. I'm a big believer in servant leadership, that we come together, that public service is about service and making a difference. We save lives, we change lives for good, and we build mutual interests that help us. So that was like 45 minutes. I was given 15. Forgive me, Evan. But that's my life story. That's my work in Africa. Um, and it's um, I'll continue on in this kind of service from the academy and maybe working with groups like IRC and 
um, you know, uh, unbound and resurrection, the future we'll see. So thank you all. I'll hand it over to you now. Thanks, man. Thank you so much. Thanks for Appreciate talking it. so long. Thank you. Oh, no. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Ambassador Young, for sharing your insights and your experience uh, in the countries that you served, and not only those countries, but uh, Africa in general. Um, just to uh, summarize, um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a conversation, 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up for discussions after that. That way, uh, if something comes up and you want more detail or you want the ambassador to expand on that, uh, feel free um, after this conversation we have. So, and thank you again to the IRC for organizing this and for Unbound, all the amazing work you do in hosting this program, and to all of you for, you know, spending time here, taking time out of your busy lives to, you know, hopefully get some, you know, information. And thank you so much to you as well for being here and sharing your insight um, and experience in these countries that you've served. So um, you've been in foreign service for 30 plus years now. What are some of the big changes that you've seen over the years? Um, you know, I, I joke that, you know, we do foreign service evaluations, you know, for the things you accomplish, you know, when you start your job, you do your job for a year, we get annual evaluations. Well, my most effective work was in the first month that I joined the State Department. Um, when I joined in July of 1989, the Berlin Wall was still up, but by the end of the month it was down. So that changed. Um, literally, when I came into the Foreign Service, the Cold War was still going on. And when I had done my work in Ireland and my studies, I had looked at U.S. containment policy about how the US and the Soviet Union were combating each other. The West and the East were in this struggle of the Cold War. It sounds, seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? But um, what I think tragically happened in that Cold War period, over the period of those 50 years of the Cold War, is that issues and places in the global South, Central America, um, Vietnam, South Africa, we often tend, Congo, we often tend to see countries in the context of east-west struggle between democracy and communism and misapplied those principles north-south. And the tragedy, uh, I eventually served in Guatemala, I served in Vietnam, I served in South Africa, but U.S. relations with Guatemala, El Salvador, uh, Vietnam, and um, South Africa were very different after the Cold War ended than when they were on. And, you know, there was one of our, I think it's President Clinton and President Obama repeated it, that the United States was on the wrong side of history during the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. And so thinking about those tectonic plates that have shifted in my 34 years in the Foreign Service, I joke, but the breakup of the Soviet Union, the coming down of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War and U.S. containment policy, uh, dramatically changed how we were able to look at the global south. And uh, my career, as I've said, has been across three regions of the global south. And because those are issues that I'm really passionate about. And uh, I would think that's one of the biggest, biggest changes I've seen. And what has surprised you the most over that course in these countries that you've served? Um, other than the amazing cuisines, I assume you've had a chance to try <laughs> the foods in different countries. What has surprised you most, you know, whether it's the people, the politics, or what's going on in those countries that you've served? You know, I would make two comments. One is what unites us in the world is profound across all cultures. And for a group like Unbound, where you engage people in Guatemala and Kenya and India and all over the world, you find that people want the same things. They want a, a, a better life, better dignity, support for their kids, you know, community. Uh, they're the same kinds of basic things human beings want. And I really have a deep belief from my faith and my family that we all have God-given dignity and we all have equality as human beings. And I've worked really hard for human dignity across the world. Now that said, that's the unifying but it's also very profoundly different across countries. 
And, you know, my experience in Vietnam, which is such an extraordinarily entrepreneurial com country where people save and they focus on the education of their kids and they they work long hours and they some of those Confucian values have really driven the extraordinary growth and in economic uh, prosperity of the of the Asian tigers like Vietnam. And even though it has a Marxist Leninist country, you know, it's grown dramatically in Guatemala, El Salvador very different traditions, you know, with internal civil wars and strife that people have come out of entrepreneurial energy of Guatemala, I mean, El Salvadorans, you know, that we see as folks who work in our communities so dramatically in the, in the diaspora. Um, the thing I would say about my 10 years of service in Africa, and this is, I know you all know this and agree with this, and I know you support me on this, but how many times have you heard people say, Africa is like a country? Like how many times do people talk about Africa like it's a country? You know, they'll talk about Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Denmark as countries, but Africa is like a big country, like billion people. It's so varied and diverse. And you can find similarities from Zimbabwe and Zambia and Malawi, which again, were part of a united, you know, even British colony in the Rhodesia, Nyasa land times. There's cultural, linguistic, other links. But the diversity you see between Harari and Lusaka and Lalongwe is profound, much less between Pretoria, Durban, Cape Town, Abuja, Middle Belt of Nigeria, and Kenya. You know, the diversity, or Mali, or Mozambique, the diversity of the African continent is extraordinary. And whereas you can talk about, like Declan Walsh does, some of the big trends, you have to emphasize the very specific development, democracy challenges. And for those of us who work in diplomacy and development, security issues, you have to look at the individual circumstances in each country. So I would emphasize the common humanity, but the incredible diversity within that family. I, I like the American motto of out of many one, e pluribus unum. And I think that's important to keep in mind just about how we think about the world too. That's good, Gia. So when you talk about, so does the U.S. have, you, know, you, you talk about, obviously people think in Africa is one big country. So does, what's U.S.'s overall policy or strategy for Africa in general and specifically in those countries? Is there an overall policy? Because obviously you have to tailor it to the nations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. I would say there's probably four big streams or buckets that we focus on. One is strengthening democracy, human rights, and good governance. Another area which is uh, related is peace and security issues, you know, stabilization for places that are strife-torn places. The other is economic prosperity, growth, inclusion, diversification of economies to lift people out of poverty. And the fourth would be investing in people uh, through health and education and exchanges. Uh, we give about $350 million uh, to Malawi, about the same to Zambia. Uh, 200 plus million of that is in investing in people through health, through PEPFAR and other health programs. But we also do a lot through education. So a lot of our assistance money goes to investing in people. but. In Sudan or Nigeria, we work a lot on peace and stability, stabilization. We work on economic prosperity through AGOA that you mentioned and other engagements to promote trade and investment. And we support, like we did with Edgar Lungu and HH, focused on democracy, getting prisoners released, good governance. So it's political governance, uh, peace and security, economic prosperity and trade and equality, and investing in people. So after the pandemic, as the approach changed post-pandemic on how U.S. engages with uh, many of these African countries or in countries in generally. After the pandemic? Yeah, of course, COVID changed our world, right? And how many ways it's innumerable, how we work here, how we interact, how kids have been socialized. And of course, that has hit Africa hard as well. It was interesting thinking about Africa with covid uh, and having been in Zambia when the COVID wave hit hard, um, you know, countries wrestled with lockdowns to various degrees and how that worked. 
it was interesting. We used to have a lot of debates. This is a brief aside on COVID, but we had a lot of debates at high levels or discussions with Zambian officials about how COVID would impact Sub-Saharan Africa, Zambia, where I was specifically. And whereas it did hit hard and tragically a lot of people, some of the people I mentioned earlier tragically died from COVID who were older in Zambia. Um, the It did not have quite the dire apocalyptic concerns that we did in some ways. And I think some of it was the population is so young. You know, the per capita, I mean, the median age in much of the con in the continent, I think is about 17 or 18 years. So half of Africa is under 18 years old. Think of that in terms of a young continent. In some ways, COVID didn't hit the young as much, you know, as it did older folks as in general, in general uh, concerns. That was, of course, a blessing. Uh, I think so that was uh, African countries, though, like Malawi, Zambia, Zim, others have been very strongly impacted by the dislocations from COVID and, you know, the shutdown of global supply chains, you know, and the, it's been the ramping back up of economic activity has been a bit of a fitful process in some ways. And so COVID's legacy is still felt. You think about the investment in people, the educational health achievements that we've seen. Um, we lost a lot of ground during those couple of years with COVID. A lot of kids didn't go to school. A lot of girls dropped out of school and never came back to school, boys too. So some of the educational dislocations and losses from COVID were, were dramatic and will be continuing on as we watch these big trends in the future. Um, so one issue that, well, not issue, but a question I've always, well, a lot of people are curious about. So when an administration changes, how how does Foreign Service, how does the State Department approach that? Because, you know, let's say you have an incoming administration that has a different policy or has a different strategy for Africa. How does that affect what you do as a diplomat and how, you know, the State Department approaches that? And furthermore, how do you engage the private sector to stay engaged when you have maybe two, you know, totally different administrations that have different views on, you know, the way forward? It's a great, great question. One I get a lot, as you can imagine. And as I looked at joining the Foreign Service, I wrestled with that question about whether I could indeed serve presidents of different parties and different perspectives and whether I would face issues of conscience that would be challenging for me. Um, what I've found over 34 years is because we're able to seek out our individual assignments, you know, the first two assignments you have, you get kind of placed without a lot of input. But throughout my 34 years subsequently, I've been able to choose that I wanted to work on Central America. I wanted to work in the operations center. I wanted to direct the Office of Religious Freedom. I wanted to go to Vietnam. I wanted to go to Zambia, Nigeria, South Africa, Malawi. So I've been able to choose all those assignments and put my name in as an applicant. I've picked personally assignments where I agree with what we're doing. And I have really only had two instances where I've been working in a lane on a policy that I disagree with. I wouldn't say that I have over my 34 years agreed with every policy because I haven't, but I've only had two conflicts for me personally where I was working on something that I disagree with. Um, I'm about to retire, so I'll tell you this anyway. We don't have any reporters here, do we? But anyway, even if you did, it would be okay. But um, when the Iraq war started, I was working in the UN political affairs office and I was very worried. I was one of those who thought the Iraq war wasn't a good idea. And I was actually called to go on a trip to Southeast Asia a few weeks before February of 2003 and the war started in March. And I decided that I couldn't go. And I wound up in early March taking a leave of absence from the State Department for five months. And then I left that one job and I was able to come back then in another job after a brief leave of absence to direct the Office of International Religious Freedom, where I agreed with the work we were doing to try to promote 
engagement with peaceful Christians, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus around the world, uh, recognizing the kind of First Amendment international right of free practice, peaceful practice of religion. So in that one case, I did a very dramatic thing. I left and came back. Um, you know, that's the minister in me. Some people don't worry about that so much, I'll be honest. Uh, thinking about the administrations changing, I would say, and I won't name the administrations, but across the administrations I've served since George H.W. Bush in 1989, I would say two of the administrations across that period, or maybe one, <laughs> has dramatically changed things that's affected people internally, where it's been like a radical transition. Like from George H.W. Bush to, to Clinton, it wasn't that much of a change. I mean, there were some fine emphasis, administrations come in with new policies, new priorities, just like a CEO comes with a new priority or a head of an NGO or a head of a church has new strategic priorities. A president will come in with new priorities, but historically there's been a broad bipartisan consensus on foreign policy in a lot of areas, and especially on Africa policy. Even today on Africa policy, when I list those four big priorities, most people who care about Africa agree with those. There is some disagreement now on PEPFAR, chat tragically. There's some disagreement on AGOA. Uh, there's some disagreement on immigration policies. So there's starting to be a little bit of cracks in our consensus on Africa policy, but largely um, there's been a bipartisan consensus since the end of the Cold War on Africa policy. So in my 10 years working in Africa, uh, and I won't say what it is, but there's been one issue that's bothered me that I disagreed with, but um, it wasn't one that caused me to take a leave of absence. I'll leave it at that. You mentioned okay. about business and NGOs and others. Um, it, it can be confusing, I think, for businesses, for NGOs, faith groups, when there are dramatic changes occasionally in foreign policy, people are kind of spun around like, what's going on? You know, how do you engage here? Uh, but some of that is those of you who visited overseas and been in embassies, you know, you change the ambassador or the charge, things can get very different too, you know, but that's true of companies, churches, NGOs as well. Anyway, I'm prone to gab, so I can go on forever. I don't think we're going to have questions for the audience if we don't give them quick. We'll cut our conversation short. So you mentioned AGOA. So it's been in force since 2000. Um, what's your assessment of how the act or how the program is? And it it seems like it's out of, uh, is it the 36 countries that are eligible to participate, 36 or 39? About half of them are fully participating in the program. How you as you know you as a diplomat get those countries that are not as fully engaged to engage to fully uh i guess get the benefits of that program yeah good question the um malawi for example is a country that doesn't really very much participate in the goa but partly that's because of the african growth and opportunity act part of that is the fragility of the economy because they don't have export industries. They don't have a lot of companies that are involved in trade in export, you know, or uh, big operations um, beyond agriculture, you know, which is largely the focus. So um, that makes it hard for some companies to come forward or countries with their companies to come forward with proposals to take advantage of the GOA benefits. Uh, some countries, I think Kenya does a lot better others, do are much more actively involved with AGOA and taking advantage of the benefits of AGOA. There, it's the reauthorization of AGOA is being debated very dramatically in Washington, as you probably know. So we'll see. We have to see what happens if it's reauthorized or not. Do you, do you think it's going to get? I don't expanded? follow it as close enough to give you a good advice, but I know it's a contentious debate. So, and for the countries that are not eligible to participate. Um, is there a process for them to be able to participate? I know there's some criteria that they'd have to meet, and what does that look like? Or do they have to wait until it's renewed if they're not currently eligible to participate in those programs? 
Yeah, there's a variety of factors that sometimes impact. I don't know all the details. Is Zim eligible? Zimbabwe is not. I no. didn't think so. Because of the political democracy, civil liberties issues, uh, Zimbabwe is not able to participate. So I think there's a few outliers like Eritrea, you know, others that are not able to participate. Some of that are on political grounds, governance grounds, uh, but I'm kind of getting out of my expertise. So you probably know more than I do. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just, you know, more, more than anything else, I was just curious the role of a diplomat when you're trying to get countries to participate in a program that's beneficial for them, but it's, it's harder for citizens to know how to, you know, I, I guess how to engage, how you get those countries to see all those benefits and get the citizens behind that. And, you know, and like I said, for these countries that are not eligible, I'm sure the citizens are looking at, okay, we're seeing the benefits of this program in other countries, why can we not be a part of it? And that might push those citizens to the leaders making changes to where they're, you know, you're able to participate in the program. So that was, I guess, part of the question to see how the role of a diplomat is and when programs like these are available to countries that are, don't, are not fully utilizing the program. Yeah, I mean, I've talked with the finance minister, the trade minister, agriculture minister, and the foreign minister about AGOA and opportunities. Okay. But again, you can, you know, you can talk to folks, but if there aren't companies that can take advantage, there's, it's kind of a missed opportunity, you know. Um, the thing too, one of the things, one of the big trends in diplomacy, I think, is that, you know, diplomacy today for the United States and countries that take a similar approach is not just like classic French diplomacy of 300 years ago, where an emissary, a diplomat or an ambassador is an emissary from a foreign leader to another foreign leader, country to country relations. Today, I spend a lot of my time meeting with NGOs, faith-based groups, companies, um, all kinds of non-governmental groups. So um, I think increasingly we recognize that, you know, it's trade, not aid, that changes countries, you know. And Malawi is actually has a very high per capita foreign assistance, you know, and frankly, it's one of the challenges. It's one of the most aid dependent countries I've ever seen, um, which is good and bad. You know, and I know that those of you who have involved in humanitarian projects will see that in Malawi. It's sustainability, you know, is a challenge. It's a huge, huge challenge. But there's a real recognition that the countries of the world who've expanded and raced forward quickest, like the Asian tigers with their economic growth, it's really been trade more than aid that's driven the change. So non-governmental actors are very, very important in that regard. So you mentioned Malawi. What are some of the biggest challenges you see facing Malawi and some of the biggest opportunities? And not only Malawi, you know, it could be Zambia and, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa. Where are those opportunities and what are some of the big challenges that you see that uh, countries are facing there? Yeah, I think it, the biggest challenges, I would say, would the fundamental challenges, which are like the tectonic plates, relate to the economy. you got to grow the economy. you got to create business enabling environment that ena enables the private sector to create jobs because government can't create jobs enough to, for the young people with the population doubling with the huge surge of youth unemployment you have to create opportunities for youth uh, that's critically critically important and the private sector has to lead growth because governments whether our government or domestic you know governments in africa or elsewhere can't create all the jobs Malawi has the public sector is hugely, frankly, bloated in Malawi. And you have a lot of people that, I mean, I'll be honest, you know, who don't go to work, you know, or ghost workers, you know, who uh, are trying to get, we have a real problem of dependency on kind of basically what per diem, you know, they call them DSAs in Malawi a daily subsistence allowance where people will sometimes not do their jobs unless they get an extra bonus of a daily assistance allowance. It's a sad truth that has to be admitted. I see some heads nodding around here and it, it's really a challenge and it breaks your heart. It's like, are you seriously not going to give the polio vaccine unless you get a DSA? 
Are you not going to show up and teach your class if you don't get the DSA? I know your salary isn't good, but you know, gosh, you know, and part of that is public sector salaries are so low, people feel they need a supplement to live, but where, where, what gives here, you know, and that's a challenge. So again, the extensive extreme poverty is deep and it's broad. Um, I think a lot of you who are involved from churches and philanthropic groups and clubs and others, you have to see that the, uh, you know, sustainability, um, self-reliance and self-sufficiency in transitioning for our development humanitarian projects is really critical and it is not easy. You all know that who engage in this space. It's not easy. Um, so you've had opportunity to serve in many different countries. I think about five different countries in Africa. As far as corruption, how have you seen that threat of corruption blunting growth in those countries? And has that changed in the course of the time you spend over there? Is it getting better or you're still seeing some of the same issues that uh, you've seen in the past years? Corruption is a huge, huge, huge problem. I mean, if you followed our statements from the U.S. Embassy in, in Malawi, we've done a lot of work working with the Anti-Corruption Bureau, speaking out about the challenges of corruption. Um, sadly, in Malawi, the really courageous anti-corruption leader, Martha Chizuma, who's the head of Anti-Corruption Bureau, she got fired uh, last December, and then we pushed and she got released. They, they jailed her briefly and arrested, and then we made a big outcry and I called the president and she got released and she got reinstated, but she has been undercut in her ability to do her job. And it's been very tragic. You know, Malawi is a very small economy. And I sometimes say that I feel like corruption per capita is almost higher in Malawi than anywhere I've been. You know, I don't want to offend anybody and make any dispersions about any countries because like one of my favorite countries I've ever served in is Nigeria. I love Nigeria. There's, I have amazing friends and Nigerian Americans in the diaspora are some of the most dynamic, entrepreneurial, amazing people I've ever met in my entire life. The Nigerians, I'll just to say, have the third highest per capita income of any diaspora group in the United States. Of the 200 countries in the world, Nigerian Americans are engineers, doctors, the deputy treasury secretary, amazing, amazing, amazing people. So Nigeria is one of the most entrepreneurial countries I've ever served in, uh, like Vietnam, but there's good entrepreneurship and bad entrepreneurship. And if you ever got an email from a prince who wants your bank account, don't give it to him. And that's not the good entrepreneurship from Nigeria. But uh, it's a country of extraordinary Janus-faced uh, challenges or good and bad mixed together but corruption in nigeria is like oh my gosh you know so i've been in countries that kind of depress you uh, my young nigerian friends including a couple young women i saw yesterday at mizzou were just shaking their heads and saying we 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 want we were hopeful a youthful candidate could change the country but the same old corrupt ways happen over and over the money the impact I used to see in Nigeria, one anecdote after the election well, it was about four or five years ago, people, when they go cast their votes in the secret ballot, you fill out your form and then you tip it. You show the people who are monitoring your vote so that then after the vote, you go line up on one side of the road or the other to get your payment for your vote. And like, you know, we would see, we would see that we would go to voting places and then you would, after the election, you'd go walk along and go along a road and I'd ask, you know, I have a driver and they said, so who are those folks and those folks say, oh, that's for the one candidate and that's for the other candidate. And, you know, so the impact of corruption on politics is huge. Again, it's tied up with poverty. You know, you don't have to get paid for your vote if you go vote. You, I mean, if you're here in this IRC right now, you're probably doing pretty well economically, right? But somebody who's desperately poor in a community and they can get the equivalent of $1 or $2 for their vote, that's a lot of money. So, you know, corruption swims in a sea of poverty, I think. So as your role as an ambassador there, do you have a role to 
stress that, you know, because if you're there and, you know, obviously you're supporting, um, you have policies that support the government. As an ambassador, how do you, I guess, address that with those nations where there's, you know, a high amount of corruption? Yeah, I mean, some of it's the advocacy of keeping Martha Chizuma in her job. Some of it is giving interviews and speaking out. I've had people in Zambia and Malawi call for me to be thrown out of the country as persona non grata because I've spoken out about corruption, refugees, and human rights and democracy. It's really interesting. You talk about the issues of the investing in people. Nobody will disagree with us to provide health and education assistance. Very few people will disagree with us on our economic assistance. Sometimes you get challenges, of course, on peace and security issues. But when you touch democracy, governance, and human rights issues, it's sensitive, right? It's sensitive. It's sensitive in Zimbabwe. It was sensitive in Zambia. It's sensitive in Malawi. Sensitive in Nigeria. It can be sensitive in South Africa. Because when you take sides, or you, not take sides, but when you stand up for a principle on a political dispute, somebody's going to like it and somebody's not going to like it. And the ones who don't like it are going to tell you, don't interfere in our internal affairs. That ambassador young, they should throw him out. You know, I had the minister of home again, not for the press, the minister of Homeland security about four months ago, went on a, the leading talk show, kind of like the 60 minutes of Malawi based out of Blantyre. And I had done an interview with the host Brian Banda the week before. And so he went on the week after to criticize me of speaking out for refugees uh, in uh, Malawi, the Congolese, Rwandan, and Burundian refugees. And he switched into Chechewa to do his interview and lamb blasted me and talked about, he made some very pejorative comments about me without naming me. And then the interviewer said, are you talking about Ambassador Young? And he kind of acknowledged that that was true. And that was over refugee advocacy. So, you know, refugees, corruption, human rights, democracy, those are the sensitive issues. And we were talking about Zambia, you know, my standing up and pushing Lungu's party to guarantee a free election doesn't make everybody from Lungu's party like me today. Lungu likes me still. He's a nice guy. I like him. He likes me. But, um, you know, if you if you push for integrity and democracy or fight against corruption, people corruption fights back, you know, undemocratic authoritarian forces fight back. And so the la one comment I would make on this, too, is that the U.S. is one of the countries in our embassies, your embassies, we speak out on these tough issues. But a lot of countries will not touch that first bucket of democracy, governance, human rights, refugee advocacy. They won't touch those issues. They won't say a word about LGBTQ persons being imprisoned. They won't talk about, you know, Muslim Christian violence, tensions in Nigeria. They won't talk about a democratic election in Zambia. They won't talk about refugees in, in Malawi. And those are, those are the sensitive issues. So, you know, it's interesting with the Chinese, the Chinese really adhere to the non-interference in the internal affairs. So they won't say anything about that. And I've had people in the Malawian government give speeches and say, we like our true friends. We like our friends that don't criticize us. So who are they pointing to indirectly? Yeah, so, but still they love us. There's a phrase in uh, Chechewa, which we've adopted as our embassy motto, uh, which is, uh, I don't know if it translates to Nyanja, but it goes, America di Malawi di Pachabali. And Pachabali means friends that are like family. So we've adopted a Pachabali relationship and the foreign minister helped me develop that term. And we framed it out of the PEPFAR program. If we're helping save a million lives, isn't that a friend like family? You know, aren't we like your, among your best friends if we're saving a million people's lives? And uh, it's been a fun public relation, I mean, public diplomacy advocacy to say we are your Pachabali. So does that translate to Nianja? Pachabali? Not, not so much. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So finally, let's, uh, what would you, what advice would you give to somebody who's considering a career in foreign service? Mm -hmm. You know, just like you, you mentioned that you'd be 
starting out in college, you wanted to be mm -hmm. a sports reporter, right? So in case somebody's here, you know, torn between sports reporting and foreign service, what'd you tell them? So let me look over the audience here real quick. Okay. 90% of you who are American citizens can come in as a foreign service officer because you can be 59 and join the foreign service as a foreign service officer. There might be a couple of you who might be like me. I couldn't join anymore. Um, it's an amazing career and I spent an hour and a half of my time at Central Methodist University yesterday and an hour and a half at Lincoln University yesterday and in about four talks at Mizzou the day before pitching foreign service careers. It has been the most wonderful, blessed, incredibly fun career I could have ever imagined. And the benefit is you have long term job stability, but every two or three years I get a new portfolio. Like I didn't even know I couldn't have found Malawi and Zambia on a map when I was at Mizzou. I mean, I knew they were in Africa, but I didn't I couldn't have found them on the map. Does anybody do global? You know, that came. I mean, you're in the IRC. You should do global. Right? Uh, but, you know, the games where you find countries like I didn't know where it was. I never even knew what part of the world Oman and Bahrain were. And yet I became an expert on U.S. foreign policy with those countries and the Arabian Peninsula. I mean, how cool to have the opportunity to serve your country, to advance the ideals that you believe in and work for mutual interest and save lives and change lives for good and have fun doing it. And then you get a pension on top of it. Hey. Good deal. Anyway, so um, I read somewhere that you you enjoy mentoring young uh, people coming up. Why is that important to you? And is that always been something that you've done, or is this something that came about recently? Yeah, I think I got that from my parents and my family. You know, the pay it forward. You mentor others. You teach others. You support others. And as I've been a diplomat for 34 years, I've done a lot of mentoring and coaching and teaching. Um, I used to coach sports for my daughter's basketball team. And um, I like coaching, mentoring. Uh, I gave my card out to about 80 students the last couple of days. And I'm going to do video conferences with them to talk about careers in State Department, AID, military, CIA, Treasury, Commerce, all the things you can do in terms of service overseas. Um, so I really believe in that. So, and like I said, my next season of service, I'm leaving a little early, but I'm going out on top, I think from the foreign service, but I, uh, I'm going to be a teacher and mentor and coach for the next 20 years. And also, I guess, I don't know if a lot of you know that you have some, I guess, hidden musical talents. And <laughs> so I, I saw that you did a did video. Did you see my video? I did see your video, yes. Uh, so I don't know if you know, but he did um, it's a Christian rap with a local Malawi rap uh, artist. Uh, was it Jingle Bells? That was the name of it. And yeah, so we did a hip hop uh, Jingle Bells uh -huh. last Christmas, and it became quite the rage in Malawi. So if you want to laugh, <laughs> if you want to just have a laugh, and those of you who've been to Malawi before, just punch in David Young, Malawi Jingle Bells. And I guarantee you, it will be, you will have a good laugh. Uh, we're actually, I'm meeting with Suffix and KBG Kelvin uh, in a week and a half, and we're probably going to do a 12 days of Christmas oh. Malawi version. So watch for that. That's so. what I was, that was my next question. So how did that come about? Um, you know, and how was that experience? I don't know. I have, I see visions and dream dreams. So I, that's how it came about. <laughs> But um, now I got to know Suffix, who's an amazing young man who is the rapper, really a social media influencer, influencer in Malawi, who's also studied economics. And I'm trying to help him get a master's scholarship to study development economics. Uh, he might be a minister someday. He's going to be, I mean, a government minister. He's a really cool guy. So it, it was super fun. I mean, if you watch it, there's another song we did, which is it's half it's about a third in English and two thirds in uh, Nyanja. I mean, uh, Chichewa, uh, which is called Dizoteka, which means it is possible in Chichewa. And it's a song about Pepfar and it's our Pepfar anthem. And so Suffix and I uh, were in rapping about 
well, I won't wrap it, but Pepfar, America, Malawi, Pachibali. And so we went through this with this anthem. Uh, and so it, it's quite fun. So um, it's interesting. A couple of you were mentioning to me before from some of your contacts. And okay, this sounds really arrogant, but uh, a number of Malawians have said that I'm the people's ambassador. And I think that's one of the nicest compliments I ever got. So. That's great to hear. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you can get the young crowd behind you, you know, that's things to look The future to. is the youth. Yep. And the future of the world is African youth. So what better way than to engage people by, you know, social media and music, which is so much fun. It's joyous, you know, and people need to be uplifted in their spirits at a time of youth unemployment and frustration and challenge and poverty and corruption, you know, and this, my friend Suffix has done some amazing videos about corruption. And we did a video, I know Jane and Rob saw it, but with the head of the anti-corruption bureau, Martha Chizuma, I mentioned with my rapper friend Suffix. And again, you can find that on the internet too. So. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we'll open it up to questions now. So um, I'll just, um, Evan, I don't know if you, okay, we'll get the mic to you. Thank you. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> so Malawi is known for its extreme diversity uh, or biodiversity, especially Lake, Lake Malawi and it also the various lands. How um, can Malawi uh, maintain that, especially with while developing its economic growth? And what um, does would the U.S. State Department have a role in preserving that? Yeah, great question. Yeah, I mean, environmental, uh, you know, protection, promotion, protection of biodiversity is really, really important. Lake Malawi, which is stunningly beautiful, has some one of the most diverse. I think it has about the most fish diversity in the world. I mean, it's extraordinary. Uh, you have an incredible variety of bird species that are only found in Malawi. It's extraordinarily rich in terms of biodiversity. Some of the challenges of climate change and impacts, they, for those of you who follow Malawi closely, they've had a cycle of, of cyclones, hurricanes that have hit hard and they're going to keep coming and it's sad. Um, Blantyre in the south of the country and southern regions lost about 800 people from the most recent cyclone. Uh, massive mudslides and flooding wiped out whole villages. Some people got early warning and villages were able to escape, but they lost their homes, they lost their crops. And for people who are food insecure and, you know, dependent on their crops, there's about, of the 20 million people in Malawi, about 4.4 million will be chronically food insecure this year. So people are struggling to eat and keep their kids from being stunted and getting enough nutrition and sustenance. So the tension is like with deforestation, how do you get people not to chop down trees to for firewood, for charcoal, when they don't have any money, you know? How do you prevent them from cutting down a few trees to make charcoal to sell it, to get a little money for their family to eat SEMA? You know, it's tough. Poverty intersected with biodiversity is a very big challenge. We have programs that we work on it, um, and but with sustainable agriculture and Psych recycling of biochar so people don't need to ch chop down trees. So we do a lot through USAID and different agencies. So your government is working hard to combat these challenges. But again, I think the biggest, whether it's corruption, democracy, health, education, biodiversity, environment, it, it comes back to poverty. And when extreme poverty makes it very challenging to help people make good economic decisions and good environmental decisions when they're facing such life and death struggles with the economy. Yeah. Uh, speaking of biodiversity, um, we need to connect because we're working with somebody in Malawi, um, Paradise Permaculture Institute, who's doing incredible things in helping uh, people uh, get back to um, what Malawi used to produce um, before there was a lot of reliance and dependence on outside seed and grain and all of those things. So we could have a great conversation. So I, my question is, um, you know, as somebody who an, who represents an organization who's really invested in Malawi, um, 
we're always trying to connect dots, you know, we're trying to network. And, and so from your perspective, when, when you see an organization like ours, where do you think the best opportunities for connection with, with this, with your role with, with government might be, um, would you have any, um, you know, any helpful advice for us as we're, we're trying to, um, do our, our work in a really thoughtful and an intentional and sustainable way, you know, where we might connect with you, with your successor uh, around the issues that we, we all care about. Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, groups like yours, NGOs, churches, Rotary clubs, others do amazing work in Malawi. You save people's lives and people, I mean, live better lives, more prosperous lives, more educated, healthy lives. So, Thank you, Zikomo Kwambiri. You know, I mean, thank you very much. Um, you know, part of it is just time. You know, I mean, I'm passionate about this stuff. You can hear it in my voice, right? I'm passionate about these things. I'm passionate about the groups you work with, the groups, the work you do. So I make a lot of time for it. I'm kind of, as my cousins know, I'm a bit of an energizer bunny and I run hard. I work hard, play hard, you know. Um, so, I would love to, you know, have a follow up conversation. Let's have a video conference, you know, and let's talk with Resurrection. You know, I'd love to talk, you know, with your group, the Rotary Clubs, others. I've already talked with some of you already, you know, but let's do that. Um, I mean, no disrespect intended, but I mean, I can't promise what my successors will have time to do. You know, you have to make priorities. I'm a big believer that. And we're actually shifting some of our focus now to non-governmental organization engagement because, and this is a little sensitive, but um, we've kind of felt that reform is not going to be strongly driven by the government in Malawi. It's just sad. It's like the forces of stasis and, you know, the system doesn't want to change and that's sad. And that's not casting aspersions at any individual, really, but it's just bureaucracy. You know, I hate bureaucracy. I've I refuse to be called a bureaucrat. I've been a public servant for 34 years and I will die one. You know, I will retire as one. But I hate bureaucracy that prevents people from engaging and doing things that have impact, you know, and bureaucracy, you know, in the long way, like Washington is strong, you know, so. I really applaud, I think at the end of the day, non-governmental organizations, faith-based organizations, business federations or companies or clubs really need to go out there and keep doing all the entrepreneurial stuff you're doing. I think seeking out opportunities to connect with your embassy is really good. Um, I'd encourage you to do that with me over the next seven months, you know, so let's keep that up. And once I retire, I'll still care about you know, Malawi, Zambia, Nigeria, I'm going to live in South Africa. I mean, these are countries that I, those four countries I deeply, deeply care about. And there are four countries that have, are seared into my future, you know, will be, I will, we will spend half of each year in Southern Africa, you know, for the next phase of our lives. So I intend to come back to Malawi. I intend to come back to Zambia, live in South Africa and Cape Town probably as a base. So yeah, use me as a resource, even when I'm retired. Thanks. David, I know you've spent a lot of time at Zaleka and the Malawian approach to refugees seems to have gotten worse lately. Um, can you comment on any bright sides that may be headed down the pike or? Yeah, the situation with refugees is really sad. You know, they just banned an organization, Anua Advocacy, with uh, Innocent Mugambi, who you know, they just banned it the last few days. So Innocent, you know, right? Good man. You know, I would just we gave a small grant to, you know, the organization and gave it to his wife about a week ago before I left Malawi in a small grant ceremony. It's Again, this is just among friends, right? But the two Malawian officials that I have the most difficulty with are the Minister of Homeland Security, who heads up, you know, 
security policy on internal security and oversees, you know, is involved in immigration stuff and the chief of immigration. Difficult, difficult, difficult people. Um, we actually sent the, the chief of immigration is a retired military guy who went to the Army War College in Carlisle. He's so proud of his, but I think he hates us. It's terrible. He's so proud of his Army War College years, but he always accuses me of interfering in their government. And he's got family in North Carolina and New Jersey and Maryland. I mean, I don't understand this guy. I feel like I want to take away his visa, but that's a whole other. You get me started, I'll tell you about that. But no, it's it's tough. You know, Malawi has not signed on to the refugee conventions. And there are six objections they made historically where they actually are re-encamping refugees. Congolese, Rwandans, and Burundians, about 6,000, I think, six, 8,000, who have been out in the community. They've been pushing back into overcrowded Zaleka. That has 60,000 people was created for 12. And now they want to move the refugee camp close to Leica and move it up to the border with Tanzania. And so what they want to do is have a one-stop shop center where they want to have refugees come across. If they don't like the people, they'll push them back into Tanzania. That's what the Homeland Security Minister wants to do. It's hard, you know. So to be honest, watch this space. But when I go back and once the IMF agreement's notched, I'll start talking about this again. Maybe I'll leave before June. We'll see. But, you know, sometimes that's the first bucket. You got to speak out. I believe, you know, I, I believe in prophetic voices. Martin Luther King's my hero. I believe in speaking truth to power. So I'm a weird bird, but that's me. So, but yeah, refugee situation, it's one of the sadder ones. The anti-corruption struggle is sad, but the saddest of all, is the plight of poor children. That's the impoverished children with health and education, nutrition, stunting challenges. That's that's my deepest, deepest sadness about my life. Perfect, we have time for one more question. And then I can stay around and chat for a few more minutes. I have to get to Center High School eventually, but I can chat for a few more minutes if you want, I'll, privately. Uh, I'll make my uh, question uh, really, really um, short, hopefully. Yeah, so um, in, when you're talking about the um, the role of the U.S. Embassy, like in all these places that you have um, um, embassies, so um, you said one of the things that you look at is the uh, uh, economic um, um, emancipation or, or, or you know, uh, bettering the, the economic situation. So my question is on the investment, because you also mentioned that uh, um, charity is better, I mean, Trade is is the right course, uh, as um, you know, uh, not not just charity. So um, I'm sitting on, or with a number of my colleagues who've been sitting on these projects for a very very long time, and um, some of these projects were kind of uh, would have American products going to you know to my country Zambia, and uh, most of these are around um, renewable energy. Which, which I still believe is the future, yeah. and I'm sure I've seen the changes that are happening on the with our with our power company here in Kansas City. All these changes that are coming, can you choose all this time? Well, that's all related to that because I used to sell solar about three, four years ago, and this is the thing that I was talking about about people having to go renewable because all these things are going to change. But uh, that's a story for another day. So my my question is um, this. Um, financial students that we have approached, they still have that negative approach of uh, what if you invest in Zambia or, or in Africa generally that then we've lost our money. So how do you change that with your influence and, and ring the bell that this is where this thing is going? As you mentioned, uh, in the next 20, 30 years, we'll be talking about the youngest population will be coming from Africa. So how do you change that? Yeah, that's a great idea. I mean, uh, I think I gave you my card, right? Yeah, be in touch. Write me an email about what your company is or what you're doing in solar and renewables. Um, I'll put you, I know that my buddies, my former colleagues and the current ambassador next door in Lusaka, and I put you in touch with them. Um, that You know, I mean, again, I'm not trying to say everything's right in Zambia, and we know that's not 
everything's not right. And everything's not perfect in Zambia. But I think it's a lot better than if my old friend Edgar Lunga was still in power. I think the environment has changed to be open for business more so. And HH's senior team wants to at least try to do some right things. They've done it in several sectors. You know, some of the big investments you know of that have come in, not in renewables, of course, all of them, but but I think there's potential. And HH is a really dynamic reformer. I have been very impressed with his executive leadership style. Among the African leaders that I know personally, like four presidents that I know, um, I won't name them, but the four that I know in Southern Africa that I've had meetings with and I've met with, in many ways, I think he's the, has the most business sense and the executive leadership skills, which are pause, pause, you know, create opportunities. So I would be really willing to put you in touch with folks. Um, I think it has to be kind of case by case, you know, given an individual operation, you know, your ambassadors, your political counselors, economic counselors, trade officers can be good advocates for you, you know, for U.S. companies. And, you know, I'm looking all the time for uh, U.S. companies that are interested in investing in Malawi. There aren't very many. There's more in, interested in Zambia than Malawi. And we have some international companies or even local business people who are moving from Malawi to Zambia because they think the conditions are better now in Zambia than Malawi. So that's part of the challenge. You have a question too? That's right. Yeah, Education USA. They track this. In fact, it's really ironic. I forget it was today or next Monday. The statistics, annual statistics are coming out about how many African students are studying in the United States. It's some good news statistics, actually. So they track that, like how many students study in each state and from which sending countries and all that. I don't think they do the analysis about economic impact. You know, that it's a really good question. It's probably a good master's doctoral thesis, you know, to look at. But I don't know of anybody who actually has really crunched those numbers because it would take a lot of economic analysis, you know. But uh, it's a really good question. I mean, I mean, a really good insight because I think that there's clear benefits, you know, when folks go back home and make a difference and or have links in the diaspora, you know. Um, just a brief comment, um, like our best Nigerian friends who are now Nigerian American, uh, a Yoruba uh, man and Ibu woman who met at U University of Southern California. He's a pharmacist, she's an educator, and they were from Nigeria, came to California, did their studies, lived there, raised their kids first few years and have gone back to Abuja. And they want run one of the leading international schools now in Abuja and their young son just graduated from Stanford and their daughter is about to go to Princeton and, you know, the amazing Nigerian family. They, uh, you know, people like that have such amazing impacts on both sides of the ocean. Uh, and we need to encourage more of that. What often happens and. Well, maybe I better not say that. The, uh, you know, it, there are challenges because on the one hand, when Education USA wants to support students, I'm going into some sensitive territory here, but uh, when Education USA wants to support students, you want the students to have the best future life they can. And of course, people fall in love and get married and then stay in the countries where they study, whether Denmark or England or Australia or America, you know. And then sometimes people don't go back home, but then sometimes people, you know, like uh, a Godi in BC, you know, from USC, they go back to Abuja too, or maybe after a period, or they build links with, um, you know, uh, um, what's the word, uh, remittances, and, you know, engagements and investments. And so there's a lot of ways that that economic impact can, can land, you know, and invest in communities in Africa, countries in Africa. But yeah, I mean, I, I think Diane's work is heroic, you know, and the uh, 
the biggest sending countries from Africa to Sub-Saharan are Nigeria and Ghana, the first two. Ghana really punches above its weight in terms of the number of Ghanaians you know, who study in the United States at doctoral levels and others. And Nigerian numbers are growing like crazy. But, uh, you know, we have Malawians, Zambians, uh, interesting Kenyans, not as many South Africans. And in part because South African universities are so good and the price point is better. You know, like you, we have, I have Malawian friends who have their daughter going to UCT, University of Cape Town. She gets an amazing education. It's a heck of a lot cheaper than Mizzou or Kansas or UMKC. You know what I mean? So the price point for a great education from Africa's top rated university, you know, is, um, I, 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 I spoke to the college president of, uh, the Mizzou president and the Lincoln university president at the last couple of days, you know, and, uh, we talked a little bit about the economics of our higher education system. And I think we need to do some adjustments because in the post COVID world, you know, our education system costs a lot of money. And I know my family spent a lot of money sending our two kids to William and Mary and Occidental. They got amazing educations, but you know, you think of that demographic wave in Africa and not everybody can spend the kind of money we did to send their kids to William and Mary and Occidental. Right. So, um, I think, um, the financing of education, the impacts of education, the multiplier effects are enormous. But, um, you know, I think that's some of the most important diplomacy we do. So I'd leave it at that. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, Ambassador Young, thank you so much for sharing so many insights with us and for this lovely morning. Joel, thank you for your moderation. Uh, and to our friends at Unbound and Church at the Resurrection, thank you so much for allowing this program to be possible. Uh, Unbound has made the generous offer uh, to give a tour of their experience center if you have not been. It's incredibly moving, uh, and that is just in the room over here. Uh, thank you again for taking the time out of your day to be part of these conversations, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Cheers.